Amen. Good morning, Bay Area Community Church. I want to give a shout out to all those tuning in who are snowed in. Maybe you're in Easton, maybe you're in Odenton, maybe you are worldwide. We're so honored that you have decided to join us today. And wow, look at the crowd here at the Annapolis campus. You guys are brave to uh, come in these elements. I know who to go to battle with. It's right here in this room. <laughs> and so I want to just uh, introduce myself if we haven't met yet. My name is Alan Smith. Um, the pastor of missional communities here at this great church. And about a year ago, I was in elements just like this. It was snowing. We went to a cabin in the woods, and we had a great time sledding and reading by the fire. You probably have done that recently. And we were on our last day. We had to get back. The weather was getting bad. Our kids had to do some homework. And so we all packed into the car. We, we got into the car, got the key in the ignition, and cranked it, nothing. So I was like, okay, God, you can do this. So cranked it again, nothing. And this is what I felt like. If you just look at this clip. Prepare make adjust the light speed. They're getting closer. Oh, yeah? Watch this. Watch what? I think we're in trouble. If I may say so, sir, I noticed earlier the hyperdrive motivator has been damaged. It's impossible to go to lights. All right, shout out to Aaron Rosa for that clip. Thank you. I felt just like that. The battery was dead. The hyperdrive could not go. And so we could go nowhere, right? So how many of you experienced that? I'm, not, I'm, I'm surely not the only one in this room. I'm sure most of you have done that maybe recently. And if we're honest, much of our lives is like that. We try to go somewhere without any power. We plan, we make our agendas, we get in motion, but there's no power. And we're in a series where we're calling us back to where that power is found, and it's found in kingdom praying. It's found in prayer. And so this is the main point this morning. I'm going to say it multiple times, is that we go nowhere as a church unless we pray. And last week, our lead pastor took us through Acts 1, and he showed us how to wait in prayer. And it was very practical. If you haven't seen that, I encourage you to go look at that sermon. And there he mainly talked about how we pray personally, individually. He did make a point on praying, the importance of praying together. Now, I want to double-click on that point, and it's going to be the whole topic for this uh, sermon today. And I just wanted to let you know of a book uh, that I recently read about prayer, and it really stirred me. And he was going through all the Bible and showing prayer through there. And on the chapter of Acts, this is what John Smead says. He says this, I discovered that every advance of the early church, each endowment of courage and evangelism, and the filling of power to withstand and conquer the enemy was ignited by earnest and united prayer. The early church in the New Testament was born in a prayer meeting of 120 people. And I want you to, to envision with me now what that might have looked like. What it looked like in the book of Acts and what it's looked like in the history of the church since then. And I'm going to pull a Pat Linnell. I don't know if I'm going to do the prop very, as good as he usually does it, but here it is. Got a prop and we'll turn it around and it is the kingdom advance will. All right. And let's get it to the right spot. It all starts in waiting prayer. That's where it begins. That's why we have a number one there. And the next thing you do when you see them wait in prayer is that the spirit falls upon them. It gives them power. And after that, we see Bold evangelism. We first see Peter preaching multiple sermons, and he's bringing it. And they see that he's bold, it says in Acts 4, because he has been with Jesus. He's been with Jesus. And it's not just the apostles. It's all of the disciples. After Steter's martyrdom, the, the, they, were per, they were persecuted, and they were scattered throughout the region, and they gossiped the gospel in all the regions. And then we see community. 
communities were formed. These church communities started to care for one another, sell their properties to, to love one another, and started to obey the great command to love your neighbor as yourself. And then from that, they were started to serve one another, and they had to develop new leaders. There was hungry widows, and they had to develop this new office to attend to these hungry widows. And you know why they did that? It's said because the apostles wanted to devote themselves to what? To prayer, then the ministry of the word. So they could continue. They knew how important it was. And so these communities were formed. These leaders were being developed. And and, and then we see the church being multiplied in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Just look at these verses that we see here. And the verse is this. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied. Where? Greatly in Jerusalem. Then we see the next phase. So the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up in the walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it what? Multiplied. And then we see the next phase where they're going to the ends of the earth. In Acts 12, the word of God increased and multiplied. These statements are all throughout Acts. The kingdom of God advances. And the kingdom of God will always advance. The question is, are we going to be a part of that? We will go nowhere unless we pray together. So why? Why do we not pray? We could have a whole series on this. I just want to submit one thing. We pray because we really think we can get things done. It's pride in our own hearts. And one of the reasons why this is the posture of prayer is because it shows our, not only our surrender, but our dependence. Where are my feet? Am I moving in this posture? I have to bow down and let God work. So if we're going to let God do his work through the church, we have to bow in our posture in prayer. And when we do this, we see the kingdom advance. So that's a fun thing to do. I may be doing that throughout the sermon. And so when we do that, brothers and sisters, I want to now take you to the fulcrum, to the the engine room, if you will, of the Millennial Falcon to see how we could turn on this hyperdrive. Because I know you Bay Area. Keep going. Keep, Keep going. There we go. I'm standing here in pieces and you're having to lose the grandeur. You did it! So they jump, they jump into hyperdrive, and I know you too want to jump into hyperdrive with the Holy Spirit. I know you, Bay Area, because so many of you are prayer warriors, so many of you smell like Jesus, you want to advance in his kingdom. So let's now look at how. How the early church did this, and we're going to look this morning at the longest prayer in the book of Acts. It's found in chapter 4, and before we read it, let me just briefly catch you up what's been happening. Peter and John went into the temple, and they healed a man who was 40 years old, and he had been lame since birth. And that caused a commotion. Thousands of people gathered around to see what was going on. Just imagine this. Thousands of people, right? And so he preaches boldly the gospel. And thousands of people surrendered their life to Jesus. Now, this did not make the rulers happy, the Jewish religious rulers of the Sanhedrin. So they arrested Peter and John, they brought them into a trial. They questioned them. They didn't really have anything to bring up against them. They couldn't detain them, but they warned them and they said, you can no longer speak the name of Jesus. Don't talk about the resurrection. They said, we can't obey you. We got to obey God. And so now we're in the text. They're going back. They're released. So now the text says this. In verse 23 of chapter four, it says, When they, Peter and John, were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, 
They lifted their voices together, and God said, they said this, this is their prayer, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of your, your, your father, our father David and your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, and they quote here Genesis, uh, Psalm 2, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. And they continue to pray saying, for truly it is this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan have predestined to take place. And now, Lord... Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand uh, to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they have prayed, the text says, the place in which they gathered together was shaken and they were filled with with the Holy Spirit and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. So let's pray. Oh, Father, would you now fall fresh upon us just as it is falling snow here in Annapolis. Would your spirit descend upon us? May I get out of the way and may your word come alive again. And the same thing that you have done in the early church, would you do this again through us? May we awaken to the amazing privilege of pray, praying together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this passage, I want to show you how. How the early church prayed kingdom prayers. And the first, it's going to sound so simple, but I just wanted to show you how important this is. The first is we go nowhere, like just like the old early church, unless we pray together. And it's important to pray by yourselves. But unless we pray together with God's people, and as I was talking this over this week with some others, someone said, is that a biblical statement? Can you say that? Can you say that we can't go anywhere without the church? And I, I, it's like, yeah, you can go by yourself. If you pray just by yourself, you go somewhere. But unless the church prays together, the church goes nowhere. Let me tell you, in the book of Acts, we only see two locations where people are praying by themselves. Peter is praying and he has this vision. And then he, and then he and that vision sends him to a man, a, a Gentile by the name of Cornelius. And the spirit doesn't fall until Peter goes to his family and it's in group as they're together that the spirit falls upon them. Paul also, when he was blinded on the road to Damascus, he was praying by himself. The spirit didn't fall and his and his scales on his eyes didn't come off until Ananias came and prayed with him. And if you look at just a brief look at the history of revivals, sure, people pray by themselves. Take, for instance, Fulton Street Revival in New York City during one of the greatest crises in our country when our country was divided over slavery. This man was disturbed, a businessman, about this division in our country, and so he convoked a prayer meeting in Manhattan, and he was the first one to show up, and nobody was there until about 30 minutes into the prayer meeting, eight, guy, eight people stumbled in there, and that became the impetus. It ignited a prayer movement of thousands of people started to pray within a few weeks, and thousands of people were converted and turned their lives to Jesus. So our text says that when these men were released, Peter and John, they went to their friends. They went to their friends. Literally, they went to their own. And then, then it ends when they're praying. It says this in verse 28. It says that they, when they prayed, they, they heard it. They lifted their voices together to God. They were together praying. Someone probably was praying for Peter and John in this passage. So, if you get thrown in jail next week and there's no grounds to hold you, when you're released, where do you go? Think about that. 
Who do you go to? Who are you going to go to? You're going to go to your safe people, your people, your own, right? Let me ask you another question. Is that people the, the church? You see, the church must be a safe place. Church today are not safe for people. That is not our heart at Bay Area. We are not a perfect church by any stretch of the imagination. When we know that there's many places that's not safe in the name of Jesus, they gather together, but it's not a safe place. But when we're persecuted, when we're under suffering, the church must gather. Many of you in this room and then many of you online have real problems and you haven't shared those problems with anyone, with anyone, and you're struggling. Please take those to the church. Take those to your people and they will lift those burdens. Just before I was preaching, a man came up to me and he shared a deep burden on his heart. He was saying it was something that blew, it was a blow that was one of his worst. I said, how was your week last week? Someone asked. It was one of the worst weeks in the last 20 years. So we prayed right there on the spot. If he came to the safe place. And I hope, that, I hope your, your burden is being lifted as we even talk now. But when the church unites, the spirit ignites in the kingdom of God, it advances. So that's the first point. We will go nowhere unless we pray together. The second point is we go nowhere unless we pray God's agenda. Look at the content of their prayer. And we'll just make a few observations here. And the first is this. Did you notice how long they spend on praising God? These are men in trouble. The the church is in crisis. And what do they do? They worship God. They're praising him. They are gazing at the glory and greatness of God. And they're just giving one tiny glance at their problems. That's that's later. They they do give a petition, but it's just briefly. I love what Sinclair Ferguson, and this is for you logical folks out there. He says this, the largeness of their prayers is determined by the size of their God. How big is your God? How big is your God? And they, when they're praying, they are so saturated in the storyline of Scripture that this Scripture from memory comes erupting out. They quote Psalm 2. Did you notice that? That is quote from memory, Psalm 2. And when they do, they get perspective. They get God's perspective on the matter. And the Spirit of God is, is just like going into their heart and he brings it to their attention. So remember this passage? This is what's going on. Now look, the reason why we're so jazzed about chapter a day is not just to make you more disciplined in your, in, your, in your spiritual life. Yes, discipline's important, but we want you in crisis with the Holy Spirit to grab a hold in your heart and bring out these things that you've been meditating on so that you can combine that in prayer. And notice also too, that when they went to scripture, they didn't just quote scripture, They saw Jesus in scripture. They see this in verse 27. It says, for truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus. They're applying the anointed one and Yahweh. They're equating Yahweh, the Lord, and the anointed one with Jesus. Now remember, they knew this guy. And he taught them to read the Bible this way. And it gave them courage. It gave them courage. Now, let me give you a little background on Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is interesting because Psalm 2 was a song sung at the coronation service of King David. That would be like the equivalent of Lady Gaga or Garth Brooks at the presidential inauguration singing Psalm 2. That's what this psalm is. And this psalm isn't just, a spe- this psalm is so interesting because it declares who truly is king over this earth. And what they don't quote is God's response to the entire world that's going against Jesus. Do you remember what it says? That God sits in heaven and he laughs. 
He laughs at all the plotting and scheming against the church and against the anointed Jesus. He's, he's like, what are you doing down there? What are you doing? This is, I've already appointed my king, and his name is Jesus. And the truth is, is that nations will rise and they'll fall. Leaders will come and they will go. But Jesus and his kingdom will have no end. No end. And that made the apostles and the disciples bold. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? And for those of you this morning, maybe you're online and you're just like, I don't know. I just, I'm here, but I just don't know the claims of Jesus. And honestly, Alan, I've just got a lot of doubts about the church, especially what I've seen on TV. I'm so confused. If, if you don't feel confident or discouraged, I just want to ask you, can you pray Psalm 2? Can you at least pray to Jesus as the king? Because Jesus, he's the safe place. He is the safe place. It's not just the church. It's Jesus in the church. Jesus is the safe place. The number one attribute in the Psalms that describes God is the word refuge. God is our refuge. He is our safe place. He can handle your doubts. He can handle your grievances against the church. He can handle your questions. You don't have to have it all figured out. And in fact, he may turn your questions and your doubting into wonder. And you know what that is? That is worship. You don't have to have it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. This church doesn't have it all figured out. But Jesus does have it all figured out. And that's who's reigning and ruling at this moment. So let us go together in prayer. And let's pray God's agenda together. And when we do that, God will advance his kingdom. All right. And the last point is this, is that unless we pray together, unless we pray God's agenda, and unless we pray for God's power, we will go nowhere. Because we have to ask for the power. He doesn't just give it to us. We have to ask for it. He says this. Uh, this is the last part of the prayer in verse 29. It says, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Consider with me what they did not pray for. They did not pray that the, they will be spared the suffering, the threats that the Sanhedrin just gave them. They, they said, may that not happen. They didn't pray against that. They didn't ask for peace in the midst of this. Not to say that was a bad, that's a bad prayer, but that's not what they asked for. And they didn't, even, they didn't even take the very words of Psalm 2 in the later parts of Psalm 2, that, which could have been appropriate. They could have said something like this. God, would you terrify your enemies? Would you break them with the rod of iron? Like, would you dash them to pieces like vessels of pottery, as Psalm 2 says? They don't pray that. They pray for their own boldness. They pray that God would enable them to be obedient to the very call at the very beginning of Acts to be their witnesses. That's what they're praying for. They're praying for boldness. They're praying for power that God would continue to work in and through his church. And so Ed Stetzer, in one of his thousands of books that he writes, if you don't know Ed Stetzer, He's one of the leading missiologists in America today, and he will be right here the beginning, the first Saturday of March for SoulsCon. I hope you're all signed up. In one of his books, he has this quote about prayer. It's great. He it says this, Prayer plants dynamite, and evangelism detonates the dynamite. If you don't have the dynamite planted, there's nothing to detonate. I'm just like, Maybe one of the reasons why I'm not seeing more opportunities to share the gospel is because I'm not praying for those opportunities. God, test God this week. Test God. Just ask him. Say, God, would you give me an opportunity to share the gospel, to share God's love with somebody today in my path? I know it's difficult in this season with masks and everything, but God loves that prayer. Test him. See if you would not answer that prayer. 
when we, we will go nowhere unless we pray together, unless we pray God's agenda, and we ask for God's power. That's how the kingdom of God advances in the world. And I love about this is that unlike Acts 1, they have to wait for their prayer to be answered. But in this passage, ah, it does my heart good to see that sometimes God answers immediately. The place was shaken. The place was filled with his Holy Spirit, and they were filled with boldness. So now what? How do we, what are we supposed to do? It's, this is, it's been super practical already, but if you haven't caught, in, uh, uh, caught yet what the application is, I'm going to tell you really, it's very simple, is that we need to pray for others. We need to pray for, with others. Not pray for others, but pray with others. And there's a quote from Samuel Chadwick. This is one of the reasons why I need to pray for others is because Satan dreads nothing but prayer. The one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. So church, we need to pray with others. That means that if you're in your family, if you're not praying with your spouses and your family, I encourage you to talk about that today. How can you pray throughout the week together, not just for one another, but together? And group leaders. We have lots of group leaders online and right here in this room. I know you all are praying in your groups, and that is amazing. My encouragement is to continue but to bring kingdom praying into your groups. Pray God-sized prayers. Don't just pray for each other, but pray for God's agenda to be in, in and through your group. And the, the, the second thing is this, is not only pray with others, but also pray for boldness. Pray bold kingdom prayers. The best place to learn how to do this is with, there's a prayer team here at Bay Area. There's about 30 or 40 dedicated prayer words, a lot of them in this room right now. And, and they are seasoned prayer warriors. And so I want to invite you to join them every Monday night on Zoom. They have a prayer meeting. And there are now, in February, they're going to crank back up an in-person prayer gathering they call the 120. It's named after Acts 1, the 120. And it's our dream that this group, this core group, would grow to 120 fervent prayer warriors. Because listen, prayer is much easier caught than taught. It's so much easier to pray just by praying with others, by listening how other people are praying. And we have some very seasoned prayer warriors in this church. And you, if you get around them, you're going to take that back to your families and to your groups and wherever you go. So text, there's a number on the screen. If, you want, if you're interested in doing that, text this number and uh, one of our representatives will be reaching back out to you to know how you can get plugged in. So in conclusion, I want to tell you a quick story. In my brief life as a pastor, I've been a part of several prayer movements and I want to tell you about one of them. And it was back in 2005, I was a pastor. I was my first pastorate at this little church. This little church is in South Mississippi and the city of Ellisville, Ellisville, Mississippi. Only a few of you will know what that is. I know Greg Dixon knows what that is. He's from this area. And in this church, I started to uh, investigate and started talking with people in, the neighbor, in that city, different pastors, and trying to find out, are pastors praying together? So I quickly found out that there was no prayer meetings. There was no gatherings for pastors in that area. So about 30 or 40 guys, uh, uh, different pastors, I invited them to my little church to pray. And about eight showed up. Uh, and, and so during that time, I led probably one of the most boring, dry prayer meetings in the history of my life. And uh, we prayed for 45 minutes. And I, I, you've probably been a part of a prayer group like this where they leave and they're like, that's not going to happen again. That was awful. And so I'm like, okay, at least we tried. The next day, I get a phone call from the, a pastor in the largest church in the city. And he said, Alan, that was amazing what happened yesterday. And I'm scratching my head. I'm like, were we at the same place? Because that was terrible. He's like, Alan, you, you have no idea what just happened. I was like, no, please enlighten me. I have no idea what happened. 
He said, Alan, that was the first time in the history of our county that black and white pastors have prayed together. And my jaw just dropped. I was like, I had no idea. I was just following the Spirit's prompting. And he said, Alan, we have got to continue to do this. And he had a plan, kind of like Joseph did with, with Pharaoh. He's like, we've got to pray and switch churches every month and not just invite pastors, but all the people from our congregations. And so that's what we did. The next month, we prayed at his church, and about 40 people showed up. The next month, we prayed again at another church. More people showed up. This thing started to grow, and so about six months into this, we have hundreds of people praying for the city. And in this prayer movement, I meet this guy. In one of my breakout sessions, I meet an amazing, beautiful, amazing man by the name of Otis Walters. Otis is a bus driver. He and his wife, Dorothy, want to have children but can't. And he told me in this prayer meeting, my heart's desire, because we can't have kids, is to disciple the kids in, in the neighborhood he called the bottom. The bottom was the rough part. It was the, it was the place where a lot of kids, poor kids, were growing up. And I was like, well, please take me to the bottom. I would love to see this, and maybe we can prayer walk it. So we did. Uh, shortly after that, we, we prayer walked this area, and we saw this house. And this house, he's like, I would love for that house to be the, the, the center of ministry for this little neighborhood. And so we prayed, and we said, God, would you give us this house? And we raised a little bit of money, and a week or two later, he bought this house. And he started to go there every day after school, tutor these kids after school, share the gospel with them. He discipled them, trained them up to be leaders. And then a few months later, I was in Peru. I was gone. And I, I, like, I, I forgot about Otis. I kind of prayed for him from here now and then. And then about... Ten years later, he, he contacts me. He said, Alan, you'll never guess what happened. The county of Jones County, Mississippi, named me the man of the year of what God has done in this neighborhood. It all started with a boring prayer meeting of seven people. Prayer ignites movements, brothers and sisters. It ignites kingdom advance, but it starts with prayer. We go nowhere church, unless we pray together. So what I want to do now is I want to turn this place into a, a brief prayer meeting. We're going to turn this into a prayer meeting. What we're going to do now is whoever you came with, if you feel comfortable praying with them, I want to encourage you to pray with them. If you don't, that's totally fine. Online, if you're with people, please pray with your people. We're going to try to pray in groups. If you came alone, we are all in this together, so you can still pray uh, with we're all family. If you're online and you're praying alone, please write in the message your prayers. That would be amazing. That would encourage others. We're going to follow the flow of this passage and pray just like the apostles did, just like the disciples did. And so we're going to start off by praising God. We're just going to spend some time and just praise him for who he is and what he's done. And then we're going to pray scripture. I'm going to throw up a scripture, and we're going to pray that scripture for a minute. And then we're going to ask for boldness. Those are the three seasons. So let's now start by praising God. I'm going to start us off, and then when I finish, feel free to out loud in your groups to praise God with me. So let's pray. Father, you are so good. We don't understand why you've given us this amazing access of prayer, but you have. We thank you that you are the sovereign God of all the nations and that you reign and rule right now, even though we don't understand what's going on. And we thank you that Jesus is still king and he has not abandoned us. And we thank you for his cross of his death, burial, and resurrection. And we thank you that in him we now live. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Continue to pray. what he's done in your life this week.
right, let's now enter our next season of prayer. We're going to pray scripture. We're going to pray. And as I was praying for this time, this passage came to mind. Paul says in 2 Timothy, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, Paul speaking here as his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Let's pray this scripture. Pray this. Yes, Father. Finally, let's now pray, asking God for power, asking God to enable us to give us his boldness as we seek for opportunities this week. Let's pray that now. Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for the intercession of Jesus Christ who takes our prayers and presents them with power before the Father. We thank you that you say you answer all of our prayers. We thank you that you move history through our prayers. We thank you for including us in this work, even though that wasn't necessarily needed, but you wanted this to happen. We thank you for that privilege. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just feel prompted to say this right now. If you're online and you have some burden that you have not shared with anybody, please reach out to one of our prayer partners online. We have a great team that would love to pray for you right now. And in this room, we have many intercessors in this room. So I want to ask, if you are in the, on the prayer team, would you stand for a second? Just stand where you are. And if you have something that you want someone to pray for, you want, you need prayer for, find them. They will love to pray for you right now after the service. Thank you for coming. Let's sing this together. Even when 